In the previous video, we revisited covalent bonding. Today, we combine our knowledge of ionic and covalent bonding as we discuss polyatomic ions. Now, the concept of polyatomic ions themselves isn't too hard to understand. We already know that an ion is essentially an atom whose number of electrons is not equal to its number of protons. As a result of this, the overall atom gains either a positive or negative charge and becomes an ion. An ionic compound, then, is a compound made up of cations with positive charges and anions with negative charges. The interactions between cations and anions mean that the charge of the overall compound is equal to zero, since the positive and negative charges cancel one another out. Here we have one of the most well-known ionic compounds, sodium chloride. Sodium loses one electron and becomes a cation with a charge of positive one and chlorine gains said electron and becomes an anion with a charge of negative one. When the sodium cation and the chlorine anion become sodium chloride, the charges cancel. Sometimes, however, this process doesn't go so smoothly. Sometimes, a bond between two or more atoms doesn't create octets, and the resulting molecule has an overall charge that is greater than or less than zero. For example, here we have a cyanide molecule. Cyanide has a chemical formula of Cn because it's made up of a carbon atom covalently bonded to a nitrogen atom. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, carbon has four valence electrons, and both atoms want eight valence electrons per the octet rule. In hopes of accomplishing this, they form the following bond, a triple bond to be exact. If we look at this Lewis structure, we'll notice that this triple bond gives three electrons to nitrogen, and since five plus three equals eight, it has its octet. Carbon, however, gets the short end of the stick here. It needs four more valence electrons, but the triple bond only gives it three. Because carbon is short one electron, we say that the overall molecule has a charge of negative one to make up for it, so to say. Now what I just said is a crucial point. The charge of a polyatomic ion, like the one on cyanide, is not placed on either carbon or nitrogen. It's essentially spread out across the entire molecule. I know that's not very intuitive, but that's the way it works. And if we look at our Lewis structure here, we'll notice that the negative charge, this minus sign on the top right corner here, this charge is outside the brackets, which shows that it is being placed on the molecule as a whole. Now that we've looked at an example of a polyatomic ion, let's give ourselves a definition in words. Polyatomic ions are covalently bonded molecules that have an overall charge. Another way of thinking about it is that a regular ion is an atom with an overall charge, whereas a polyatomic ion is a molecule with an overall charge. One thing that's important to remember regarding polyatomic ions is that, although they are covalently bonded, the molecule itself behaves like an ion. This makes sense if we remember our crucial point from earlier. The charge on a polyatomic ion, I think I'm going to call them PIs from here on out for brevity's sake, is distributed across the whole molecule, not placed on one specific atom. Since the overall molecule has a charge, it's going to bond the same way ions bond. If a PI has a negative one charge, it will want to bond to a cation that has a positive one charge, and vice versa. There are more notes here pertaining to the difference between regular or monoatomic ions and polyatomic ions, but I think we've discussed this enough already. The most basic and fundamental way to put it is that a monoatomic ion is an atom with an overall charge, while a polyatomic ion is a molecule with an overall charge. The chlorine anion is an example of a monoatomic ion, and the ClO2 molecule here, the technical term of which is a chloride ion, is an example of a polyatomic ion. We've already looked at the cyanide PI and gave it a name after looking at its structure. We can do the same with other polyatomic ions. We can draw Lewis structures and try to determine their chemical formulas and whatnot. But the easiest way to know the name or formula of a particular PI is simply to memorize the most common ones. Generally speaking, I try to minimize the amount of memorization when teaching chemistry, mostly because it's very tempting to memorize concepts without actually taking the time to understand why those concepts work the way they do.
In this case, though, we've already discussed how polyatomic ions work, and the reality is that it'll save everyone a lot of work if we go ahead and memorize some of the PIs that come up frequently. So without any further ado, here's our first set of polyatomic ions. The two listed here have an overall charge of positive one. I'm not going to talk too much here, so feel free to pause the video and write these down, make a table or diagram of your own, whatever you feel like. Down here, we have some polyatomic ions with an overall charge of negative one. This table is the biggest by far, since there's quite a few polyatomic ions with a negative one charge. I'll scroll down in just a minute. There, that's the rest of them. polyatomic ions with a charge of negative two. Seven of them in total. It might be noticed that chromate and dichromate involve chromium, but it's important not to get mixed up here. Even though chromium is a metal, it's actually bonded covalently to oxygen in this case. Or if we're going to be very technically correct about this, we could say that the chromate ion has an ionic character that is so weak we consider it to be a covalently bonded molecule instead. Alright, last one. Here is a table of polyatomic ions with an overall charge of negative 3. By the way, it might have caught someone's eye that there's a little pattern that shows itself regarding the PIs that end with the suffixes ITE and ATE. The PIs that end with IT always have one fewer atom than the ones that end with eight. When I was trying to remember this pattern for my chemistry class, I used a somewhat odd bit of word association. The French word for small, or petite, spelled like This, in its feminine form, has the same ending spelling as the it polyatomic ions, and these ions are smaller than the ones that end with eight. Incredibly strange and an utter butchering of the French language, I know, but it helped me not get these two suffixes mixed up, so maybe it'll help at least one person out there. Standard disclaimer here. This is not a comprehensive list. There are other polyatomic ions out there, but the ones in the tables above are the ones I've encountered most often. It's pretty common for teachers and professors to give out handouts or cheat sheets with their preferred polyatomic ions on them. So if you have access to that kind of resource, make sure to defer to that. This point is worth reiterating. The atoms inside a PI are covalently bonded, but the overall molecule forms bonds like an ion. For instance, lithium nitrate is composed of the lithium cation and the nitrate PI. The former has a positive one charge, the latter has a negative one charge, so they bond and form the following compound, LiNO3. Here are two more examples. One common test question is to ask the student to name a PI given its formula, or alternatively, ask them to give the formula for a PI after providing the name. The rule of thumb to remember here is that for a bond between a PI and another substance to form, the, the charges sorry, must cancel out. 
you might remember being asked to find the LCM, or least common multiple, of two fractions. A similar idea applies here. If we look up at this example of calcium phosphate, we notice that calcium has a charge of positive 2, whereas the phosphate PI has a charge of negative 3. The least common multiple of 2 and 3 is 6. So what we do here is try and figure out what number the original ion's charge needs to be multiplied by to get 6. Let's look at calcium first. It has a charge of 2. We can forget the sign for a moment. How can we get from 2 to 6 using multiplication? We can multiply it by 3. So 3 becomes the new subscript under calcium. Same thing for the phosphate PI. How can we get from 3 to 6? We can multiply 3 by 2 to get 6. So 2 becomes the new subscript on the phosphate PI, which goes in parentheses so we can show that there are 2 of the overall molecule. We can actually make this even easier by using our cross-multiplication method we discussed in a previous video. The charge on one ion becomes the subscript on the other ion. We'll use both these strategies on our example problems, so don't worry too much if what I just said doesn't make much sense. Speaking of which, here's example one. Predict the chemical formula of magnesium hydroxide. This is, of course, an ionic compound. Magnesium is a metal. And it has two valence electrons that it wants to get rid of. When it does this, it acquires a charge of positive two. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion with the formula OH minus, carrying a negative one charge. In order to cancel out the negative 2 charge on magnesium, we have to have two hydroxide ions. So the final formula for magnesium hydroxide is MgOH2, written like so. Example 2 now. Predict the chemical formula of aluminum acetate. We're going to dash through this one if that's alright. Aluminum forms an ion with a charge of positive 3. The acetate ion has a formula of CH3COO and an overall charge of negative 1. Let's try our crisscrossing or cross multiplication method. This charge loses its sign and moves down here, and the same happens to this charge. The subscript 1 can be removed. This is our final answer, ALCH3COO3. Example 3. Predict the chemical formula for potassium phosphate. Potassium forms a cation with a charge of positive 1, since this element has one valence electron. The phosphate polyatomic ion has a formula of PO4. and an overall charge of negative 3. Our least common multiple method is probably the easiest one to use here. 
the LCM of 1 and 3 is 3. So we need 3 potassium atoms to balance out the negative 3 charge on the phosphate ion. This yields a final formula of K3PO4. Last one. Example 4 is a bit different. Name the compound with the chemical formula Na2SO4. Na is the element symbol for sodium. The SO4 represents the chemical formula for the sulfate polyatomic ion. The name of this compound is sodium sulfate. Before we end for today, I'd like to remind everyone that my complete notes for Unit 1 are currently available at my personal website, the link to which you can find in the description below. Once you get there, navigate on over to the Resources tab at the top of the screen, scroll down a bit, and it should be there, ready to download. In the next video, Unit 2, Video 4, we will discuss chemical nomenclature. Thank you for watching.